we're going to get moving. Hopefully, we've had a lot of folks that have joined us. Um, if you've just joined us, please introduce yourself in the chat, um, and uh, we will get our gathering started for this January 19th. So today, we're really excited to have Dr. Joy Banner with us um, from the Descendants Project, the co-founder and the co-director of that. She will present uh, historic and heritage preservation as successful strategies of resistance. So we'll be hearing from her in just a little bit. Of course, uh, the folks that bring this program to you, myself with the Wetlands Discovery Center, we've got Meta Owens uh, with the Louisiana Division of the Arts, uh, Rachel with the University of Louisiana Lafayette, and of course, Gary from Nicholas State University. If there's ever anything that you would like to see um, uh, brought up in, in this program, please reach out to one of us and we'll be happy to discuss it and try to make that um, happen for one of the gatherings. Of course, this is sort of our disclaimer statement, just to let everybody know that we don't have all of the answers. We don't support any one particular strategy. Um, we just know that we are in a very complicated time with some pretty wicked problems. And we are here to have some of those difficult conversations um, to, to, to move forward with some of those things that we have to, to tackle. Of course, again, here are our partners, the Wetlands Discovery Center, Louisiana Folklife Program, Louisiana Folklore Society, Center for Bayou Studies at Nichols, and Center for Louisiana Studies at ULL. None of this is possible without our funders. And if you've been with us before, you know that this program is funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, and BETNAP. One thing you may not know is that we have a new funder that we'd like to share with all of you and to say a huge thank you to the MJ Sindler Family Fund for Culture and Media. Um, special thanks to them for joining our team of funders. Uh, at this point, I would like to pass this on to Maida to talk a little bit about the Passing It On workshops and some things we've got coming up in the future. Yeah, I'm real excited that we have more funds uh, for Passing It On workshops, and we already have a lot of requests for them. They're going fast, and uh, these are intended to uh, help a master tradition bearer pass on a tradition within their own community, and it can be anything. We can give to individuals or to organizations to do this, um, which it's, and uh, we're announcing the next, uh, the first workshop for this year is by Sabina Miller. Um, she's gonna um, teach the making of the crepe paper flowers uh, that were especially used on grave sites. This is a precursor to uh, plastic flowers, quite honestly. And it was a way to put flowers on graves. But she, in her family tradition, they use the flowers in uh, for all occasions. They, uh, it, a fascinating story that she can tell. So uh, I'm putting in the um, chat along with all the other details that you will come across in the um, in the slideshow today. Uh, so don't worry about taking notes. Everything I post in the uh, in the chat. Thank you so much for that, Lena. Um, so this is a bit of our agenda for today. We're going to hear from Dr. Joy Banner. Um, we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers with her after her presentation. Then we'll ask her what her hope for the coast is. We'll talk a bit about our position statement and give you information about our working groups and other programs of the Biocultural Collaborative. We'll open up the floor for any announcements from any of the um, members in the room. And then um, we invite you all to stick around with us after one o'clock from one to 1.30 for the informal discussion. Um, so with no further ado, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce and welcome Dr. Joy Banner of the Descendants Project. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Banner. I think you're still on mute. Uh, if you click, yep. Sorry, everyone. Hi, okay. I'm here. <laughs> I want to go ahead and share my screen, but thank you so much for for having me. I am really, really thrilled and honored to be invited. 
um, to speak today on a topic that I have loved my whole life, historic um, heritage, preservation. I loved um, growing up. I know it might sound kind of odd, but always loved um, old houses and historic architect, um, but also liked, um, I liked heritage. I'm in Wallace in St. John the Baptist Parish and grew up around, grew up blessed to be um, in the family network. My, my neighborhood is my, my family, my community is my extended family network. I think a lot of people in Louisiana have the fortune of being able to say that, but we are all aware that our, our communities are being threatened. And so I just wanted to, and so it, it, when we talk about these strategies, I wanted to pass along some strategies of resistance um, embedded in, in historic preservation and in heritage preservation, cultural preservation that, uh, that we have found to be successful strategies in our efforts to protect our community. So I wanna, I wanna underline and emphasize um, the word successful because I think we've, we, or we're so inundated with the, the negative battles and the challenges that we're going through that we forget that there are strategies for us to be able to win these fights. Um, so I'm really glad that you all are, are joining joining us today and you're here um, in my presentation. So with that, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, okay. So first of all, who are we as an uh, as an organization? What is a Descendants Project? Uh, we are in an, an emerging organization. We just started. We incorporated at the end of 20, 2020 and didn't really get started until early 2021. And me and along with my identical twin sister, Jo Banner, she's the other co-founder and co-director of the Descendants Project. We always had this love of, again, culture and heritage. And we grew up with the desire to you know, protected. Um, we grew up um, listening to the folklore, the, the folk tales of, of my grandparents and her generation. We loved listening to and hearing the way they grew up along the river, which was, it was more farming based and they hung out on the levee. We were right along the Mississippi River. So it just, I was always enchanted by my community. Um, both me and my sister, we did, um, we worked in positions at various plantations. So Laura Plantation was the first um, plantation that I, I was an administrative assistant. It was my first college job while I was at LSU. Um, and we went on to work at different sites. So Evergreen Plantation, um, Joe, my sister went to work for the River Parishes Tourist Commission based in Laplace. It represents three parishes. And so she represented um, a, three, well, a variety of plantations. And then um, after being a professor for eight years, I actually came back in 2016 and was a director of communications for Whitney Plantation, which is the, the only plantation um, in this area that is a slavery museum. Um, and, and the interesting aspect about working um, at those different sites is that Joe and I are descendants. So we descend, we have people enslaved at, at Whitney, at Evergreen, and at Laura for sure. Um, and there's probably other sites, you know, they, these. Uh, plantations are so close by each other and these communities are so intersected that we probably descend from people that were enslaved and a lot more. Um, but with that background, we took our role as, as descendants um, in our organization with the commitment to the inter intergenerational healing and flourishing of the Black descended community in the River Parishes. Um, so we talk about the, we and we engage, we discuss, we plan strategies for how we can eradicate and, and deal with the trauma of the histories of enslavement um, and set, settler colonialism and, and environmental degradation. But we also like to uplift you know, the beautiful culture that we have um, as a result of a, a lot of intersecting communities. And we really uplift you know, those West African and indigenous traditions in our community. So with, um, with that being said, and I'm actually, I skipped over I skipped over a slide and no, I'm not gonna go back because I, I don't wanna mess up my presentation. So we're just gonna start from here. Um, but I had a, a, I had a, a map that you've all seen that PERSAC map from around the 1850s, I believe 1848, that gives you the historical layout of all of the plantations along the Mississippi River from, uh, from New Orleans to uh, up, uh, up through Baton Rouge. 
Actually, here it is. Um, so yeah. So here is this plantation map from, I'm sorry, 1858 that shows you all of the different plantations. And so all these slivers are actually plantations. So there's hundreds of them, as you can see. So the river parishes of Louisiana, um, those river parishes, especially in St. James and St. John, densely, densely concentrated with plantations. So now we go from that to a different type of map which is representing Louisiana plantations, but you can see that it is, there's a, there is an image, right? There is a, a feeling being portrayed here. There is these houses of grandeur. Um, a lot of the houses on this map are being toured as museums. So I will point out if you see Oak Alley, that's right here, Evergreen and the Descendants Project is based sort of right here in the middle. So there's a, it's conveying the tourism of it all. So we uh, actually, this little stretch from Baton Rouge on down to New Orleans is known as plantation country, New Orleans plantation country. So that is the way that we are being marketed. That is the way the state is, is marketing um, this region. But I, I want to show you too another map. Now, these are the plantations on the Mississippi River in 1858, so taken from that same map, the current locations of petrochemical plants in 2021. So there's almost a one-to-one -one ratio of plantations to plants. And the, the yellow dots that don't have, that which represents the plantation, but don't have the red plants yet on them, uh, they are currently being marketed to bring in more industry within the river parishes. So I showed you that map to establish the plantation to plant link. And the, the reason why there was so much plant plants on the footprints of these plantations is because plantations are industrial development. So for us, the sugar cane and rice, mostly sugar, but sugar cane is not indigenous to Louisiana. Uh, it's from Papua New Guinea. So this land had to be developed first, right? We don't we go by, by we pass by sugarcane fields. It looks agricultural, purely agricultural. It looks green, it is green. So we forget that this is not the natural landscape of Louisiana. This environment had to be stripped away. Trees had to be cut down. You know, the Mississippi River has, has had to you know, change course. Levees had to be built um, all in support of this industry. So now when we have petrochemical comes in, the way plantations were set up, whereas a few amount of owners with a lot of land. Um, so now it's really easy sometimes for petrochemical to come in and still negotiate with families that have, that have inherited uh, thousands of acres of land, which would probably be unlikely that they could do that in any other um, any other area. You, you'd be hard to negotiate with hundreds of people to buy the land, but the plantation system is already set up for it, right? So they come in with developed, already developed land, um, already cleared land that's right for their development. Um, and as a result, we, we see this one-to-one -one ratio of plantations to plants. Now, what else, what we don't see on these maps and what's not represented in that old PERSAC map is who's living around these plantations. Um, and usually, it uh, usually those communities like mine are inhabited by black descendants. So people who are de who descend from people that were enslaved at these plantations. And so that is what I'm gonna talk to you today about our current challenges, um, our, most, um, in, um, our most immediate and pressing fight that I'm, I'm proud to say we are currently winning and those strategies that we've used um, in, in the fight and are still employing in this fight. So, um, so first of all, I want to show you what uh, the current industry that we are in, or we are threatened by. This is a the Greenfield Grain Terminal, which uh, proposed to develop right in my little community of Wallace. So, what you're seeing here, whoopsies, is a little pink building is our um, our cafe that the descendants, from, well, me and my sister own. It's called the Fifo Lay Cafe. So, I I think I'm in the right audience of folks for of, of of people to know what the FIFO lay is. So clearly we love our traditions and our old folklores um, in this part of the in a, a town, but that's the proposed development. 
So you see 50 silos that are over 300 feet tall they would completely block out the sunlight for at, for at least um, the, the whole entire morning. So my community, which sits behind this cafe, um, it was a neighborhood that my great grandfather founded over 120 years ago. Its residents, the black descendants, would be in the shadow of this developer, right? And so we, we would not be able to live in our community anymore. It'd be 100 tons more pollution being pumped into what's now Cantor Alley. Um, there'd be, in, a, in addition to this structure, there would be um, also a dock that's being built out. So that's more pollution, more river on the, tra more traffic on the river, more tra traffic on the roads, more pollution. Um, qu our quality of life would be destroyed if this thing were to come. So for the last, so we're going on three years now, we have been fighting to keep this grain terminal out of our community. And the good news is that they were scheduled to, I think, start breaking ground and start constructing since 2021. Um, and we said, oh, no, oh, no, you're not. Um, and, and we started organizing and we fought back as a community. And we've used so many different strategies um, to just go. We, we fight them in all of the ways that they attack us. And their fight is di dynamic. And so our fighting back also is dynamic. Um, so we get credit for being really strategic and creative in the way that we that way that we move and we act. But th these are all the ways that the system really are really is um is, is attacking us and attacking our communities. So just um for reference, here is what the scale of that project would look like. And you see, it's as tall as the Statue of Liberty, and this is as tall as Big Ben. Um, and for your reference, you see a little. Whitney Plantation right here. So look how teeny tiny Whitney Plantation. And Whitney is a mansion. That's a big house. So that's Whitney. So our houses, our residential houses would be even smaller. And then at the end, you can, I mean, right next to Whitney, you can see a little teeny tiny person. That'd be you. That'd be us. So um, my thanks to Brian Davis from the Louisiana Trust for Historic Preservation, who created this rendering for us. I want to point out though, this is where our strategy begins. So when you when when companies come in with these developments um and you and you get the permits and you can see even at, at, with this poster how it says to mail mail letters to the United States Army Corps of Engineers, that's in response to a permit application that Greenfield had to submit to the Corps of Engineers to get permitting. So strategy number one is be on top of your permits. Uh, have a way, have your system of, of, of getting alerts. You can sign up to find out which permits, which um, developments are being applied for. And you have a 30 day public commenting period. It's so important that you organize, get those public comments in um, within that 30 days. So that's, that's a big part of the strategy. But the second part of the strategy is the way that you communicate and especially using visuals. And if you have someone um, or have a way of being able to communicate the impact of these developments on your community in a way that people will understand. Okay, um, so now moving on. So when um, I think, ooh, ooh. sorry, my, my mouse is a little sluggish today. It's, it's too cold. Um, so another part of our, our strategy, and I'm sorry, my picture of Whitney is, is a little blurry, um, is related to, when we think about that 1858 map that I just showed you, and you saw all of those plantations. And if we're talking about a history of slavery, you know, yes, there is, there is trauma associated with it. There's these legacies of slavery associated with these plantation sites. There is a continued... Um, narrative, I think, of violence and exclusion that are a lot of these touring facilities. And so you think, what good can come of, of these plantations? What do, we, what do we do with them? The good part about plantations from a historic preservation standpoint, well, first of all, for, for me, I, I find plantations, um, and I don't force my opinion on anyone as to how to view a plantation, 
But for me, I see them as the houses that my ancestors built, right? And so to me, they are sacred spaces, sacred ground. However, if people feel a different way, as a complex history, um, there's a lot of trauma associated with them. I will also say too that um, plantations, a lot of them have a lot of, have research that is the that are the archives for African American families. So the genealogical records, you know, the ways that those grounds. And I say that as you know, people that are associated for people that are associated with sites. Your sites have for many African Americans are so important to us finding our ancestors, right? And if we so if you start thinking about your site as a repository for African-American history and start embracing it and, you know, and centering your site that way, um, there is a huge benefit that plantations can have as these repositories. But another um, benefit that they have, and even a plantation tourism industry, as problematic as it is, is that a lot of these houses are, have established um, an industry or an, an economy that is as a successful heritage and tourism economy, right? These sites that I'm, I'm showing you today, the one, um, this is Oak Alley Plantation. It's a National Historic Landmark. Evergreen Plantation is a National Historic Landmark status. And Whitney Plantation is a National Register Historic District status and will soon be applying for a National Historic Landmark status. And Whitney Plantation actually has buildings so old on its site well, let me be more specific. It has a um, a French Creole born from the 1780s, 1790s that is so old is the only one um, in the United States. It qualifies as its own National Historic Landmark. So you'd have Whitney, the National Historic Landmark, and then within Whitney, you'd have another National Historic Landmark embedded within it, which I just think is, is wonderful news um, in, in terms of our fight. So um, let me go back to, let me start off here. So we have, and I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around. I was a professor by, by um, I'm a retired professor. And I used to drive my students crazy because I put together a presentation and, and kind of bounce around. So sorry about that. Um, where, how, where does the historic preservation as a strategy come in? So Specifically, Section 106, the National Historic Preser under the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. So Section 106 requires that each federal agency identify and assess the effects its actions may have on historic buildings. Under Section 106, it must consider public views and concerns about historic preservation when making final project decisions. So any project that's going to have federal permitting, federal assistance, federal funding, or is interacting with the federal government, Section 106 applies. So I won't go through all of these, but here are some of the things that, um, that Section 106 requires. You have to initiate consultation by notifying the appropriate consulting parties, and I'll have a list of those. And so consultations between the federal agency, the historic the state historic preservation officer or your SHPO, your tribal historic preservation office officer, your TIPO, and other consulting parties, um, including but not limited to the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, certified local governments, and members of the general public with an economic, social, and cultural interest in the project. So that's a broad category for us as community members if a project is coming into your community, you have the right to request to have consulting status when they're making decisions about the review of historic, cultural, um, and um, other social resources. And part of that 106 process is to determine if there are any, uh, any properties that will be affected, but then also if one of those projects could potentially be a national re national uh, register historic district or historic place or national historic landmark. So not only we saw that Whitney and Evergreen and um, Oak Alley, they all had their national historic landmark status, but it doesn't just apply, just, it just doesn't benefit them. If you have a community where you have historic assets like those houses and you think that you know, there could be some eligibility, then that's also something that the that the um that the federal government has to consider. 
Um, another part is considering what the adverse af uh, effects are. And with, with the adverse effects, it means that a project has to mitigate for those adverse effects, right? And so I want to be clear that it, that if there are historic assets and cultural assets found, it doesn't mean that a project will get shut down because of those assets. Um, but I'll talk about some other um, some other strategies how you can help to support um, pressure to have those resources protected. And I do want to go back to um, this beautiful picture of a black union a black union soldier as based in Louisiana and his family. Because one of the elements of our history that has come and that has come to the that has come to light in a in a beautiful way that I think is so inspiring um, is that our community, my community of Wallace, which people drive by on the river road every day and say, "There's nobody here in this little community. There's nothing important that happened here." which breaks my heart because I love my community so much, right? But what we have found, found out about our little community of Wallace is, is, is that it's actually, it's an unincorporated village, we know that. So I'm really embracing this idea of us being a village. I think that's really important for you to put what it means to be a village, right? Um, but then we found that this village was really founded by um, black, so uh, self-emancipated, Black men who ran off to fight for the Union and fought for their freedom and after emancipation got together with their cohorts, formed these financial co-ops, came back and bought land and formed the communities that we live in now. So my little town of village, my little, uh, my little village of Wallace, which I've loved so much, now I found out that it was a free town. It's a freedom colony, you know, and what a beautiful history in the in the space of all of the trauma of plantations and growing up as a you know a a a, a black woman in, in in plantation tourism and all and really loving heritage and culture but, but feeling kind of pulled both ways um, in terms of loving that history to find out that we have this beautiful history of resistance and freedom and identity and culture um, that we're able to go in now and uplift these communities um, so. Even when you are being challenged by adversaries as big as a billion dollar owned company or a billion dollar investor from Greenfield, there's still beauty in these fights. There's still so much to learn in these fights. So going back to our consulting, consulting parties and who has it, automatic consulting party status, I should say entitlement, it goes to the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Now, what is important about the ACHP is that they advise the president and Congress. They don't have regulatory power, but they are so powerful in advising um, and, and negotiating and navigating policy, recommending policy and, and making recommendations that are very, very strong, right? Um, we have been, it's not all the time that the advisory council will sit in on a 106 and be at the table with you. For our section 106, with the with Greenfield Grain Terminal um, permitting, ACHP is there with us. So that is um, amazing, amazingly, amazingly grateful. Also, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, they don't necessarily come in and sit at the table with you. They have come in and sat down with us. The Louisiana Trust for Historic Preservation, uh, Brian Davis, I, I think many of you have probably interacted with him. So wonderful, so amazing, so fantastic. Um, so please, if you don't know him, get to know Brian Davis. And then the Louisiana State Historic Preservation Office, so, uh, so El Shippo. In your local governments and tribes um, and applicants and the, the, and the applicant themselves. So these are people that get automatic consulting party status. But you... If you have, um, if you are a member with the demonstrated interest in that undertaking, you can request and receive consulting party status. We requested consulting party status, and we um, had a media strategy where we were communicating the threats to historic and cultural assets. Um, people really resonated with the the community at large and the media at large resonated with um, a us being in Cancer Alley and b the threat to I, um, yet, as of yet, unidentified uh, burial grounds 
in, in the site where Greenfield will be situated. So Greenfield, in these developments, and if you think back to the map that I, that I showed you, you can't develop anywhere on the Mississippi River without it being on a plantation. And wherever you had a plantation, you had a burial ground. So when you're passing in front of these sugarcane fields and you see a group of trees, seemingly out of nowhere in the middle of a, of a sugarcane field, it seems out of place. Um, that could be either an old structure, an old sugar mill, an old train depot, which are historically and archaeologically important, or more than likely it's a burial ground of people that were enslaved. And those trees were trees that they planted, magnolia and willow trees, to mark their graves. And so when we think about like resistance and we think about what, our, what my ancestors you know, passed down to me, I think they were passing down a symbol, right? A, a sign that, hey, we're still here. We're giving you a marker. And, and not only that, we're giving you a tool. We're giving you the, 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 the gift, the blessing of ourselves, literally our body, our remains from the past to come and protect you in the here and now. And so um, as part of the strategy, understanding your landmarks, understanding what your landscape is telling you, understanding what wildlife is telling you, know what an eagle's nest looks like, know, look, know what the birds are that are around you, understand your marine life, understand your wetlands. Um, I never knew this, but we had, we have actually a beautiful little um, basically undisturbed swamp that sits almost right by the, by the river road. And it's so, it's, it's so adorable. It's so cute. I love it. Um, I didn't know this, but you know who did know, know about it? Your hunters and your fishers. Your hunter and your fisher people knew, know about it. So having a conversation with people that's engaging and interacting with your wildlife, know as much about your community and that landscape as you can. Okay, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll speed this up. Um, I just, I get really engaged. I love this, this topic so much. So it's a part of me for, for going on. Just to point out, I, I, I talked about the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, what they contributed to this 106 process, which I thought was, uh, was just, I, I had tears when I read it and it's so powerful as a tool is that, so 106 is about historic preservation. So if you go into a 106 meeting as a consultant, then you're limited to if you say impacts to your communities, impacts to the environment, impacts to um, um, like climate issues, et cetera, you'll be, you know, you'll get the feedback of, well, this is historic preservation. You know, it's outside the scope of the 106. But what the advisory council did that as that since we are a descendant community, they established this link of if you have a project that disturbs and disrupts a descendant community, then you are disrupting history. So in a sense, our presence here as a descendant community is almost like we're our own little walking national historic landmarks, right? And our own national historic new registers. And so if you make us move, then you are impacting, you're impacting that history. So we can talk about the elements of, you know, of the environment and how, and how it will displace us and that link between us and, and, and the protection of historical assets was really clearly made so well by the advisory council. And I wish more people, um, I'll share, I can share the letter because I would love for people to use this as a precedence and, and use this as part of their um, of, of their tools for your community. Because you can apply what's being told through us, to, to being told to us, to your small communities too. And I'm almost done in terms of, finding out the history. And I talked about the Union soldiers and, and, and finding out more about them. But there's a lot, of, um, a lot of interesting aspects about your community that you probably don't even know. So for me, my, for my little town of Wallace, um, you see this right here, Papa Dukey and the Mud People. Pa Papa Dukey is a, a Black descendant. He's descended from a, a civil, a, a Union soldier. He's literally grew up right down the street from me as I'm talking, but he was a, a musician that got relatively famous, traveled the world, um, became part of the hippie movement and traveled with a group of hippies. He came known as Papa Dukey and the Mud People. He came back to Wallace, um, set up, I call the Wallace, the Wood, Woodstock, Woodstock of Wallace behind the levee, uh, which is now where our Veterans Memorial Bridge is. And he had a song made about Papa Dukey and the Mud People. Um, by the subdued, and that record actually gives a good explanation, a good narrative 
of Papa Duke and the mud people and what was happening behind that levee. Um, and so many, so this colony actually stayed there for two to three months, right? And it's, there's still people in the community that remembered when they were there. Um, there's a lot of nudity and smoking that went on and dancing and music. I'm so jealous that I was not there, um, but that happened right in our, in our community of Wallace. Um, you also see right um, in the middle, this is a picture of Henry Dema. He was formerly enslaved at Whitney Plantation, self-emancipated, went, joined the Union, Union Army, fought, um, a, achieved a, a rank in the Army. I cannot remember it now, um, but actually came back, was a politician. He was the last politician that got ran out and was um, ran out before, well, right after Reconstruction. And so um, not only Henry DeMa is from St. John the Baptist Parish, but he is one of the co-founders of Southern University and he's buried in St. John the Baptist Church in Edgard. So again, establishing you know the like the historical figures that were here. This picture in the left hand corner, I'm also fighting for the levy itself to be considered a historic um, social a whole social space. As you can see, the group of of mostly young women that are on the levy, they had just participated in a walkout in the 19, uh, 1960s. So they were protesting because two teachers who were pushing back against segregation and pushing for um, equal rights in, in terms of schools and equipment, book, books got fired. And so one day they walked out and they sat in on the levy. And you can see the police officers being um, called in. Um, these are original photos from the Times picking unit they used. Um, and lastly, you see David Bowie here and you're like, what does David Bowie have to do with St. John the Baptist Parish in Wallace? Well, on his record of Diamond Dogs, he, um, and this is, this is problematic. This is a bit problematic for me, but I, you know, I, you know, want to acknowledge, and I think this is a, a beautiful person in our community that I want to uplift. But um, the woman featured here was part of a Coney Island show. And she has some um, different, as you can see, um, uh, anatomical differences. Um, and she was part of the, she was part of that show. She had shorter, shorter limbs. And so she was called the turtle lady. And she um, actually traveled with the, with this, uh, with the circus. Um, the circus used to come here in, in St. John Parish and use my great grandfather's land to set up the circus. And the turtle lady was one of the Circus. Well, she was one of the, the people that came and she was from here and then she actually moved back here in Edgard. Um, so she really got quite famous and, and quite wealthy um, as, as a performer. Um, so with that, I think I am at the end. Oh, one last part talking about restoration, historic preservation. On your right hand, on, on well, this picture here on our right hand side, Many Waters is the future headquarters of the Descendants Project. That's an old plantation house that we have moved on the property about 15, 15 years ago. Um, it's, we found out it was a plantation from the early 1800s. We also found out that we are descended from people that, were, that inhabited this house, the Sheck Snyders. Um, so we got a grant from the Mellon Foundation, part of that Humanities in Place, to restore this building and to restore two other buildings in our neighborhood. So we created a Descendant Cultural and Education District. So um, we we created this, these historical spaces um, that we've de designated, and this is a future rendering of what it will look like. And then this is um, we were also in Architect Magazine. All of this is what we use when we put putting together our argument for historic preservation and strategy. We use all of this media, right? Um, and one one last one last success that I wanted to, wanted to tell you that we as part of our fighting as a grain terminal terminal. It was the reason why we are targeted by industrial development is 30 years ago, um, our parish president took a bribe um, to change that zoning to industrial for Formosa, which has been in the news a lot, right? Well, here in Wallace, where that grain terminal wants to set up is the former location of Formosa. And even after the parish president went to jail, they never, they never returned the zoning back to residential. And so part of our fight, we didn't sue the company, we sued the parish of St. John. And we're like, you need to return this zoning to residential. And so that was our fight and we won. So after 30 years, we were able to nullify that industrial zoning. 
So um, with that, I will leave it there. Say thank you. Here's my contact information. Um, the website is a descendantsproject.org. If I forgot to put that on there. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for such a um a, a strong presentation. We we have time for maybe one or two uh questions, and I'd like to to start that. Um is there anything with current plantation culture that you find offensive or that you find uh, places to celebrate? You know, like uh, I'd like to hear from you as a descendant, how do, you, how do you feel about the current situation of plantation houses and how they're used? Yeah, good question. So there's a lot, I mean, I'll be honest, there is a lot problematic with plantation with plantation tourism. And mostly because the plantation tourism model was actually set up by garden clubs in Natchez, Mississippi, right? And they were never about telling the story of a, of a plantation. They were about creating a tourism attraction for Natchez. And so we, you know, now in the plantation tourism space, we think that that is the status quo for how you present a plantation, but it was always designed to be entertaining, right? So when, so it's the challenge is when, for instance, when I was at Whitney and in this work, you know, people think that when we are, we're giving the real history, like we are engaging with documents that the owners wrote themselves, right? So we are presenting their information from their documents. We're not presenting what you know, some people in Natchez want to present the house as. And so it makes it seem like we're the ones, like we're going in for the jugular, that we're intentionally trying to be traumatic and being brutal, but we're telling the history of why this plantation house is even here, why these mm -hmm. grounds are even here. So that's the truth in what a plantation is. And if you don't accept that truth, then you should not be the one visiting a plantation, right? So um, yeah, that's the way that I see it. In yeah. terms of what can we celebrate, I think, again, the archives that plantations have access to, the work that um, plantation owners and plantation managers are doing to connect with descendant communities um, and, 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 and rep be more representative of descendant voices and share those resources. Um, all, I think it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to learn and grow and also yeah. an opportunity for plantations to have the protection Right, because it would have been very hard for Evergreen um, and even Oak Alley to go and say, shut down progress, right? Just protect our plantations. And you're surrounded by a black, commu black community that's disadvantaged and need the jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So Evergreen is being protected by descendants saying, there is value, you know, there's economic value and there's social and ancestral value in these houses. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one one thing I really appreciate that you said that it was one of my takeaways from it is that those spaces are sacred spaces. You know, it's not it, it's not um, and it and it should be viewed as that and honored as that. So uh, thank you for that answer. And um, and that. so, um, Nora, you have a question and then we'll, we'll move on. But I encourage people to stick around for the informal part of um, our talk today, because we can continue the conversation with Dr. Banner. Uh, Nora? Uh, yes, uh, I was wondering if you have uh, considered or uh, looked into the possibility of the uh, prime and unique farmland situation for permit review. And I know all of the plantations were originally built along the river because that's where the really good farmland you know the soils are so good because of the river flooding and I know when I took ag economics as a freshman many many years ago that professor said that was the worst thing he could imagine that they're putting all these chemical plants on the best farmland in the country so right. just curious if you've looked into that um not 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 really but that's a that's a great that's a great point and I think it's um so important to to recognize that we have anything grows in Louisiana soil. You know, there's so much we can be creative with what type of farming that we do here. Um, my sister is, is particularly, she wants to look at lavender farming. 
um, because it, it cleans the air and then you actually get more money for lavender than you do for sugarcane. Yeah, so, um, so there's different ways of, of, of growing, growing more vegetables, growing fruit, setting up the land so that we don't have to use as much pesticides and fertilizers. That's a, a great, really great point. Natalie, I see that you have your hand up. If it's okay with you, are you able to stick around till um, after one? Um, yeah, I can stick around for a little while. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate Thanks. it. I'll let All right. Um, so one of the things, let's see, um, that we like to do is we like to ask our presenter, um, what's your hope for the coast in light of in light of all of the challenges that we have, Dr. Banner, where do you find hope? So I I find hope in the amount of resistance that I do see in, in resistance in a way that is is positive. And I don't know another word to, to use other than resistance because I think um the way that communities are coming together and learning about their lands and learning about their water. I didn't know as I didn't know about my land and, and my water and, and the impact of the of the coast and, and all as much as as much as I should until it's until it got threatened so much. So I think mm. what is happening is out of this moment of of crisis that we are coming together in a way and, and we are de developing the dynamism to fight back. So it's not like it's lost. It's like we're coming together and we and we're re-strategizing. And yeah, I, I've had the opportunity to, to to be at meetings where communities have come in with knowledge of the landscape and knowledge of the waterways that have been. They, I don't know if you've been keeping track of um, went to, and is it terrible in Parish? Um, that was with Conoco Phillips. There was a threat there for for CCS, and sure. I went. I had an opportunity to go back uh, go back to one of our meetings. Um, I think it was Bayou Buff that was being threatened, and. Folks came in there and knew their landscape. And so they knew where the Indian mounds were. They knew where the eagle nest was. One woman was like, I can, I can tell you how to get through that swamp with my with my, my with blindfolded, my hands tied behind the mouth. And really, the, I think Conoco Phillips came in there and was like, Oh, wait a minute. I, yeah. You're not gonna, we're not gonna mess with this community. So yeah. I see that happening and I'm very hopeful. Yeah. I appreciate that. That was uh, very well put. Very well put. Um, again, please, everyone, stick around until after one o'clock, where we'll be able to talk a little bit more with Dr. Banner. We just have a little bit of housekeeping left to get through to get to that point. Um, here is some information on our position statement. Please feel free to scan that QR code. It'll take you um, to the website where you can read that position statement. And we encourage you to sign on, have your organization sign on to that if you agree um, with what we're saying. We also have um, some quick information about our working groups. Um, we just have a few minutes. Uh, if anybody is here, if Theo or Amy, if y'all are here with uh, Cultural and Coastal Planning, and if you'd like to give an update um, for a minute, we're happy to hear you if you're not with us and in the room, um, just so that you know, the next meeting for uh, culture and coastal planning is Monday, January 22nd at 2 p.m. If you go to louisianafolklore.org, you'll find more information where you can sign up to be a part of that working group. Um, similar is Rachel with us today, and if not... Uh, same goes for, for this working group meeting Tuesday, February 20th at 6 p.m. You'll see the email there that you can um, write down to connect with that group. Artists and tradition bearers, um, Lauren or Mark, anything that you would like to say if you're with us? Again, uh, just to say, uh, excuse me, Jonathan. Yeah, just to yeah. say that uh, we are, we had some new folks last, our meeting this Wednesday, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, next month, I'll be giving a presentation on very environmental witness through songwriting, and uh, we hope to have more speakers in the future. Made to let us know that we have a little budget yeah. that we can uh, use to uh, bring some artists and tradition bearers in. So we're looking forward to that in the coming months. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that update. Um, again. The email is there on the screen if you'd like to join this group. And it, next time it meets is Wednesday, February 21st at 6 p.m. Um, the, the working groups um, are really doing some uh, amazing uh, work. 
Um, and so we really do encourage you all to join any of those that um, may be of interest to you. This one is uh, preparing receiving communities. Um, that, that's with uh, Tracy and Haley. Not sure if they're in the room or if you'd like to give us an update. Uh, if not, that group meets on Tuesday, February 20th at 2 p.m. Protect, protecting collections. I'm not sure if PUD's in the room. Um, this group meets on Thursday, February 22nd at 10 o'clock. Um, and uh, some more information, culture and climate conversations. Um, Teresa, I believe Teresa's in the room. Um, if you have any words you'd like to share with us on that, Teresa. Um, and if not, that's okay. And making sure that uh, you guys have that information. Again, louisianafolklore.org is a place that you can get more information on that program. Um, the 2023 Louisiana Statewide Resilience Annual Report. Maida, can you give a few words about uh, what that looked like? I think this was um, the, the report that was issued by Charles. Yeah, Charles Sutcliffe, um, well, the whole uh, climate action plan, it's part of that. Uh, this is the first uh, statewide resilience report, and I'm delighted to see that they're acknowledging the importance of culture in, in various aspects. And most uh, importantly is that the migration receiving communities adapting in place and cultural preservation is one of four priorities for this coming year. You can find that on page 16 and I'll uh, put the, the link in the, pad, in, the, in the chat. Thank you so much for that. Um, we also have our Community Voices Project. I'm not sure if Jamie is in the room and would like to give any updates on that. Um, and if not, um, we can talk a little bit about next month's um, gathering. We will have Lance Nassia with us, who is a commercial fisherman and owner, owner of Anna Marie Shrimp, which is um, a commercial uh, fishing business. Um, it seems that we may have a little bit of momentum moving toward discussing a little bit more of this issue and forming a working group around it um, from last month's gathering where we also we had uh, Sandy with us discussing the challenges that are uh, facing the commercial fishing industry. So if that is something that interests you or you know someone who would be interested on that topic, please encourage them to sign up for next month's gathering. All right, and so the last bit of the formal part of the presentation, if anyone in the group has any announcements that they would like to share with us or any, um, you know, if we went through the working group um, slides pretty quickly, if there's anybody from the working groups that would like to share anything, um, this is the moment to do so. And... Um Yes. Jonathan, I'll, I'd like to add that the Protecting Co um, Collections uh, Working Group is going to have a speaker in, in February, that uh, Vicki Esserman is going to talk about uh, what happened with the traditional boat building museum and how uh, Nichols has uh, embraced it and going to help them um, at, at, by at least providing land for them. But uh, so that the boat building museum can continue. That's wonderful, yeah. And that, I, again, one of the things that I, I may not have done a really great job in explaining as I was going through those slides is the working groups are really the place for where the boots on the ground action is, take, is happening. And um, in those Zoom meetings, what's nice is that there are those presenters that are coming in and starting to be little mini uh, by your culture gathering. Um, so again, if you're interested in any of those topics, uh, they get much more specific about uh, that information and the presenters that they're bringing in. So please consider joining some of those groups. Um, Gary, uh, I see you got your hand up. Yep. Thanks for allowing announcements. Um, I have two things to remind uh, the, our, our conveners about our, our, our audience today. One thing that's coming up on March 9th is the uh, Bayou Studies Conference that's gonna be on Nichols campus. And we are still um, welcoming folks who might be interested in presenting. So we're looking for speakers to give a 12 minute talk or students maybe to give a poster on ways that your research or your projects are connecting ecology, 
as with history and culture and heritage of the Bayou region. So probably everybody on the call today is doing something that that would would fit. So if you're interested yeah. in that, you can email me or John Ducey. That's the dean. And another thing that's coming up, you mentioned a while ago was climate conversations. I just wanted to um, remind folks that the next one is going to be at Chauvin. That's at the Chauvin Sculpture Garden picnic and the blessing of the fleet celebration. That's on Sunday, April 4th, 14th. And we are thankful to BCC and Teresa Parker and Maida for supporting that. And we're going to have uh, on stage Cecil Laperus and uh, Deborah Cunningham. And they're going to be talking about how climate is affecting life in, in Chauvin Copadri. That's it for me. Thanks. That's awesome. Thank you for those updates. Honora? Oh, yeah. I just want to give an update about the receiving communities group. We uh, met yesterday and we're kind of laying out some plans for the year. And one of the things is that we have moved our date, our regular date, uh, because there were some conflicts. So now we're the third Tuesday. So if anybody had conflict with the previous date, look, check that out. And we're looking to alternate between having speakers and having just working brainstorming days. So we, so stay tuned. We should, like you said, we should be having some little mini BCCs in that group. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that update. We appreciate it. Um, all right. So that concludes the formal part of our presentation today. Thank you again so much for being with us.